Welcome everyone to the HSPF training by DSI. We are in the video HSPF 640. How do I use HSP EXP Plus to generate model reports? So just a recap. In this HSPF 600 course, what we did was that we developed a UCI file using basins and then use WinHSPF to add pollutants to that UCI file so that we could run an HSPF model that could simulate multiple water quality constituents. If you have any confusions in these steps, then you should go back and look at the video HSPF 610. Then in videos 620 and 630, we went through the review of some of these parameters. These reviews were very general and just to get you jump started on that uh, uh, topic. But if you want to get more details on how to calculate, how to estimate, I suggested some of the supplementary reading materials for you to look at. Now, in this video, I want to show you how to use HSP EXP Plus to generate model reports. And I'm thinking that this video might be longer than the other usual videos, uh, those 10 minute videos, but we'll see. So what we are going to do here is we are going to use the same model that we created in HSPF 610. And we know that how we set it up in WinHSPF, then we'll use HSPXC Plus on the, that same model to generate the model reports. And we will look at some of these reports to understand what is in there. And to get more details, again, you will have to look at the manual, but hopefully this will get you jump, give a good jump start. So let's get right to it. So I start HSPXC Plus and in this, I have already browsed to the model that I created in HSPF 610. So I don't need to run the model. I have run the model before. And what I will do is I'll skip some of these things. Some of these things I have explained before, but so I will not go over these. Constituent balance report. I think we have seen water and sediment, but I'll just check box on these. And I'll click on start. So one of the other thing is this reaches for constituent report and receiving water model. So let's say your watershed is draining to a reach number 54 or 60 or whatever. And that's a terminal reach. Or you have multiple calibration reaches. What you can do is here you can put out the number of the reach and the reports will be area weighted for that specific reach. We'll look at that uh, later on. So we'll just click on start. I have already done uh, generated this report uh, earlier because it takes about 10-15 minutes. It's about two years of monthly data it has to read but so many reports can take long time. So let's uh, go to that folder. And these are the reports that I generated. So there are a bunch of reports and I would suggest you to look at each one of them individually and I'll focus on nitrate for now. Nitrate and total nitrogen. So this is a box whisker image. It's a graph where it shows that what is the loading rate of nitrate as nitrogen from all the land uses. So it looked at all the pervious and impervious land uses and calculated the amount of nitrate that is going from the land surface to the river and grouped them according to the land uses. So there were probably four or five water wetlands pervious land operations and this is the range of nitrate loading from them. In this case it looks like barren or mining has higher uh, nitrate loading rate and whether these loading rates make sense for your watershed or not that you have to estimate and you have to figure out. But this gives you a good snapshot 
of what are the main sources of nitrate in your watershed. And before you even go into the calibration of nitrogen and trying to match the observed and simulated water quality constituents, this would this is a step before that where you want to make sure that your model is not simulating unreasonable loading rate of pollutants from different land uses. You can get some general range of these constituents from the MPCA technical report that uh, I mentioned in the previous videos also. So this is a image. This is one image that it generates. And then there is also uh, reach re, before we look at reach budget, we'll look at total nitrogen land loadings report. So I will want to open this report in Excel because it can help me look at the filters and stuff. So earlier I could just right click and say open with Excel, but somehow Excel does not let me do that. So I have to drag it. Okay. So first I want to do is I want to set up filters here. Okay. Now what this report does is rep this report does is tells us operation type. So per and number P101, P101. Operation description. What are the land uses? Every year for each year. Total ammonia. So this is the name that is written in the HSPF uh, in the UCI file. This is the name that I refer to as it in EXP plus. This is the units that is mentioned again in the UCI file QTID. If you'll see that. This is removal of call ID call SD by association. That means if this constituent was attached with the sediment, how much of that uh, removed from that process. And if the same constituent what was attached with sediment, but there was a gully erosion, then how much of that constituent is removed from that process. In this case, total ammo uh, ammonia is not associated. Any nitrogen c constituent is not associated with sediment. So we can ignore that. So it doesn't matter. Then wash off of this constituent so ammonia how much of uh, total ammonia is flowing through the surface how much of that is flowing in interflow how much of that is flowing in groundwater flow and some of all of this gets into the reach so to understand quickly first we these are the reports for all the years and then an average so i'll uncheck all some annual. There are multiple land uses. I want to only look at agriculture, cropland. Then there are all the constituents. So, see, this is total ammonia, nitrate. That's the name in the UCI file. That's how I'm referring it to here. In the UCI file, on the land, the organics are simulated as BOD organics. When they come in the water, a portion of that is converted into labile organic nitrogen. And if you remember in the previous video, I show how there is a multiplication factor to BOD that is used to calculate organic nitrogen and organic phosphorus and organic carbon. So some of that BOD comes as labile and some of that BOD comes as refractory organic nitrogen. Now, some of all of this is actually presented in total nitrogen. So if you want to go get a detailed report on how the nutrients, which portion of nutrients are contributing to, do, to total nitrogen load, this is the report that you have to look at. It's not that you have to look at this report every run that you do, but this gives you a good baseline to move on. So we can close this. And then we can also uh, look at total fo total phosphorus land loadings report is the same. What we look at 
is the reach budget and I always have to drag it to Excel to open it so reach budget if you remember we did a sediment reach budget in one of the videos and what it does is that for each reach how much is coming from non point sources so all those operations those operations the land operations are flowing into the river depending upon the area contributing from each operation to the uh, river the non point sources are calculated so in this case 1400 pound is coming from non point sources and looks like there is uh, some mass balance issue and that is something i'll have to check uh, in, in the model about 1000 uh, pound of mass balance issue so out of 14000 that comes in 13000 pounds of total nitrogen is flowing out and there are processes happening in the river that are absorbing minus 1341 pounds in the in the in the river so those processes are causing the loss of this much of nitrate now 1475 is calculated from the land areas but the river sees that it is only seeing this much of uh, 13727.53 nitrate so that is the reason for this uh, mass balance and all of them are about 1000 pounds or negative or positive so i'll have to look at that model why it's happening but this is the kind of report is generated for the model now there are some other things that you you can look at if you if your model was inputting nitrate through a point source it will show up here general loadings like sometimes people create general based time series that is a function of other constituents in the model to calculate the loading from different sources into the river so that is a generate load sometimes a reach may have multiple exits so divergence happening upstream is what is coming from upstream area so in this case if uh, reach 28 in reach 28 probably another reach flows in so 27469 is from the other reach that is flowing it into it so these are the different sources through which the nitrogen is flowing into it so these are very detailed reports to explain what is happening in the model so you have the full transparency in your model results and when you are analyzing some issues why it is happening or if you just want to do a QAQC of your model is producing results but do they make sense in a physical world then you actually go and look at these reports and some of these reports are also used uh, in the in the final model modeling report so that you know which land uses are contributing how much uh, nutrients let's also look at fecal coliform so fecal coliform and again it's it's very similar than than it's not very it's probably exactly same in terms of all of these uh, headings but it tells you where this constituent fecal coliform is coming from in the watershed and you can do all the math to figure out if it uh, if it's reasonable for you and this is the same thing in a image format in a graph format that shows that most of the vehicle coliform in this specific watershed is coming from cropland and partial land whether it makes sense for you or not that you have to decide on your own now one of the things that i'm not sure if i mentioned in the previous videos is model qaqc it's not perfect but it is pretty good actually uh, when you check box on this one only these 
boxes are active. What it does is that it allows you to check box on this thing and it looks at the parameters of the model and it looks at if the sediment erosion that you are simulating makes sense or not. And then you have to figure out it may be justified for your model or not. When you click on start, it runs for a few minutes and it generates a HTML file. So I will open it with the Internet Explorer. Okay, so this is a HTML file that actually looks at the model, tells you running time, when was the last time run was done, HSPXC plus version, it looks at the area reports. So outlet location is reach 54. It looks at always the terminal reaches and the calibration reaches and provides you the land use distribution for that specific reach. So in the terminal reach, the total area is uh, 6 million. One, it's 601,931 acres actually, sorry. Um, so what is the distribution? And you can always cross check it with your GIS data to make sure that both the values are similar. Then it looks at all the model parameters values and compares it with the typical values. Typical values is a database inside HSPXC plus that I have developed and when I was at Respec and we looked at hundreds of previous HSPF models and reports to actually come up with this kind of database. And the MPCA technical report that I have a, a technical note that I have referred to multiple times that has most of that database there. So all the parameters, almost all, the parameters are actually compared with that database. So it says that if there are more than 10 cases, then it makes it in a separate table. So some of this table looks formatted in Internet Explorer, but not in other browsers. Anyway, so you can look at all the parameters, which ones are reasonable, which ones are not not reasonable. Some of those you can adjust and run QAQC again to make sure they are in the uh, range that is accepted. And sometimes it is justifiable to have the parameter not in the range. And your report should actually reflect that. Since uh, TO and uh, water temperature series were not available in the WDM file. The diurnal pattern was not uh, evaluated. But the idea is that you can generate DO time series for multiple reaches in your watershed. And what this will do, it, it will look at the pattern and say, that does not look right. The DO is uh, lower in summers or the, the, the summer season is, is weird or actually it's looking at only uh, su summer season. Maybe it is trying to find a difference in day and night because we are assuming more photosynthesis happening in the day. So deer should generally be higher in the day, those kind of things. Diurnal pattern, uh, it looks at the change in water temperature uh, in the morning about four, five in the morning and then four, three, four, five in the afternoon tries to look at that difference. And this uh, idea is to just quick quality check whether your model makes sense or not. Then water loading rate, it says that wetland has greater outflow than urban. So there is more water flowing from urban areas, from wetland areas than urban areas. That does not make sense. So you may want to parameterize it. Uh, reach water volume analysis. So in some cases, what may happen is like this is a two year model, so it does not make sense. It says here. But in some cases, what may happen is that 
you may have a lake and the outlet is not designed properly or parameterized properly and due to the evapotranspiration and the drainage happening that lake may end up drying after four five six years and that kind of if you are and that lake if that lake is upstream it is not always easy to go and look at which lakes are performing well or not so if you have some water bodies where the volumes keeps on increasing over time or keeps on decreasing over time which is not justifiable then you can this kind of report can help you with that it's not perfect but it, i think it does a good job of uh, telling you that so now this is the sediment loading rate what it tells you that in your model in general the sediment loading rate from different land uses is far lower than the typical limit that is uh, mentioned in the MPCA technical note. It's up to you to probably change it maybe it's justifiable in your model and it refers to this uh, image and so th this is reach depth bed depth. What happens is that if your reach is, uh, this is sediment storage first actually. So sediment storage is, that means the sediment is deposited on the land surface and the erosion happens and that DET is, that is the material available for erosion reduces after every rainfall event. If you have not parameterized it properly, the DETS material can keep on increasing that may cause more uh, erosion in the latter part of simulation or it just keeps decreasing so in first event or so you have soil available for erosion but in the latter part of the simulation there is no erosion happening so that may be happening in some of the uh, land uses so like in this case the DET is increased by 120 percent maybe reasonable maybe not it's just two year period so it may not again make sense I uh, think it does not have the bed depth but uh, the idea is that it looks at the depth of sediment bed in all the rivers so if you have let's say the most upstream reach is causing a lot of scour but the reach just downstream does not ha have that much of scour due to the parameters. So what will happen is that all the sediment from the reach one will just finish in after two or three or four storms and all of that uh, sediment will end up in the, in the downstream reach and the downstream reach will have a lot of sediment. And what might happen is that due to a storm the amount of sediment that may lose move from reach to may cause excess uh, total sediment uh, concentrations so these kind of nuances you cannot always look in and this QAQC report helps you with that this HSPXC plus like I don't work on it anymore uh, it is still maintained by respect so if you have suggestions about that adding more things into it there are uh, they'll be receptive to that so anyway again there is a uh, other nutrients where the lo uh, loading rate is mentioned I think at some point of time they should be uh, working on adding other constituents like uh, heavy metals or fecal coliforms or stuff like that so these are bunch of reports that are generated and then as I was showing you earlier that if you select uh, if you uncheck all of this and let's click on only water and click on reach 54 so what it will do is that it will generate an additional report for me to show area weighted values at that specific reach so I did only water so it finished quickly so water snake at reach 54 and there are again four or five of these I like to look at this report but you can look at any of those 
Okay, so let me just look at it here. So what this what this report tells us that from all the previous land uses, how much area is contributing? What are the different sources of runoff? So water, we have actually done that before. So let's look at uh, total nitrogen. And hopefully it will take only a couple of minutes or probably less. Again, this uh, message is not entirely, not the most accurate. Okay, since I had TN land loadings, these reports were open in Excel. It just PXC Plus did not like it. So I'm just closing all the reports to need them. Okay, retry. Okay, so these messages are not 100% accurate, but they're pretty decent actually. So let's see if it has created any of the report by now. Total nitrogen. Okay. So it's complaining to me that it wanted to look at atmospheric deposition for total ammonia and it did not find it. In our model, we had not set up time series for atmospheric deposition. So that is fine in this case. But in general, you have to add uh, atmospheric deposition time series. So it's complete. Let's look at this one. Okay, so total nitrogen report, it tells me what? Ammonia from sediment and sed uh, scoured sediment from gully. No, ammonia is going from there. Some of the ammonia is moving with surface flow, some with interflow, some with groundwater flow. On watershed average, 0 0.085. Nitrate plus nitrite. 10 times more than that, labile organic nitrogen, 0 0.082 refractory organic nitrogen. This is the total nitrogen. Uh, seems like total nitrogen does not have watershed average time series, which is funny. Uh, anyway, so this tells you how much of these nutrients are flowing out from each operation and earlier we were looking at total this is a different way to look at it for these uh, these values now you can also look at the reaches so this this is uh, per operation so all the operations are here in this report so if we look at control f r 54 all the reaches are here okay Generally, if you name the reaches properly in the GenInfo block of the UCI file, what this report will do is this report will group the reaches according to the name. So if you have 10 reaches named as main stem and five reaches as tributary one or so, so it will group main stem one here, tributary one below that. So it's a good idea to name those reaches accordingly. Anyway. So those process fluxes that we are seeing in, in uh, that report earlier, those are reported here also, how much of nitrate is coming in, how much is uh, getting out. So for each one, how much is uh, inflow and how much is outflow. And if there are any inconsistency between the reports and stuff, then we can always uh, look at it. And this gives you a good idea of what is happening in your entire watershed. If there is some parameterization issues that you should uh, look and figure out and find it. So I think you should not focus on the numbers that I'm showing here because this was just a 
first model that came out of VinHS PF. Uh, I did not spend any time on parameterization because that's a completely different beast. But I just wanted to give you an idea of all the type of things that you can look at when you are doing the model parameterization. Now, if there are some specific things that you are interested in knowing, you have uh, more detailed questions on any of the, of the topic, please feel free to let me know. I know this video is longer than all the other videos, but I wanted to show you the breadth of these uh, reports. At some point of time, I'll also make a video on how to make uh, the graphs from specification files. But if, if you want to get started on that, you can always look at the help file here. It actually describes what kind of uh, file that you have, what kind of files that you have to create. Okay. What kind of file you can create to generate the graphs automatically. So once you've done it, all the graphs will be automatically generated. It's very useful when you're doing calibration. If you want to have like 20 different graphs, 30 different graphs, you want to see those parameters quickly. You don't have to point and click to make those graphs. So that you can specify in a, in a CSV file. So that is something that you should look in in the user's manual or at some point of time, I'll make a video on that. In my same channel, I have linked to some older videos that was made by one of my colleague, uh, Cindy McEachin in um, Respect. She made the video on multi-simulation manager. Basically, you can set up a CSV file to do sensitivity analysis, uncertainty analysis, scenario analysis. And I have done that uh, for some other projects before and some other students are actually using that for their uh, master's and PhD research. So that's that's a pretty useful tool if you want to try that, or maybe you can try that for calibration. I don't know, maybe you could uh, set up multiple parameters and different values and get an output something and say, okay, this uh, range works best for it. You can do many, many things using multi-simulation manager. So if, Please feel free to share your experiences. How do you like that, uh, any of the feature, or if you, they were useful to you, or if you have more questions. There's a LinkedIn group called Basins, and uh, I try to post HSPF related stuff there on a regular basis, but that, that is where something, um, you can ask uh, questions on that. So with that, I'll conclude this video. Thanks a lot for your time and patience. See you in the next video.